watchman on the wall. Don't forget, he has an advantage. He's standing on the wall, looking over the wall, and says, there's a lion coming, there's a lion. We in the city, well, got to make a plan. Do we, uh, do we uh, fight the lion, or do we run from the lion, do we escape the lion, what do we do, or do we eat the lion? What do we do with the lion? So Warren is going to tell us about the lion, and then other pastors will tell us what we do in, in, as pastors of the flock. Warren, God bless you. Thank you, John. John's been very, very supportive in trying to get the warning out. And I guess I can't pass up that opening line that he just did about the lion. Uh, I'm from California. You may have noticed in the news that the San Francisco Zoo had a Siberian tiger that escaped and actually killed one young man and seriously injured two others. And the zoo, was at, when they, their first report was they couldn't understand how this Siberian tiger had gotten out of its in cage. They said the cage was like 18 feet high. Then they measured it and found out it was 12 and a half feet high. And the standard, if you go by the book, was like 16 and a half feet. So I looked at that and I told my wife, I said, you know, that's kind of an interesting little metaphor for what's going on in the church. We have Satan who prowls around like a, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And we look at that line and we, we, we go, yeah, that's true, but do we really believe it? And I think if you look at what's happening in the world today with the teachings that are going out and the people that are following them, and I'm going to develop this. And I'm talking big names. Uh, I'm, I, I hope I don't trouble people here, but you know, Paul mentioned names. Uh, you're not going to really know what's going on if you don't name the players. But the church has, has a low wall, and there's a lot that's getting in and getting out right now. And uh, I just thought that was a really interesting metaphor. So thanks for uh, giving my opening line there. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to say in terms of uh, shining as lights, you know, uh, Jesus is the light of the world. Um, when I was in the New Age, and I'll explain kind of like what that is, when I was in the New Age... I didn't know there was a devil, and I didn't know that in the Bible it says that the devil comes as an angel of light, and that means that he's pretty deceptive. Uh, Daniel, in warning about the last days, in Daniel 8, 24 and 25, he says about Antichrist, he says that he shall destroy wonderfully. And let me tell you, what I was involved in felt really wonderful. When you're deceived... It isn't like you're walking around and you're just like, I mean, you're in darkness, but you don't know it, but it feels good. You really think what you're doing is right. And I wanted to just open with uh, this scripture, Paul's prayer for Israel. And it was really funny because I just thought of this when I was sitting in the back of the room, and I'm sure it was the Lord, because somebody came up to the booth and talked about somebody having a zeal for God. And I said, well, that's interesting. I just kind of what I was thinking of opening with. In Romans 10... Paul says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God, to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And that's exactly what we did when we were in the New Age. We had a zeal for God. We really believed that what we were doing was going to bring peace to the world, and that when people got it, and we had a an attitude towards Christian believers, which was they're really good people. They just don't quite get it. They don't quite get it that, that they're divine, that they're God. That's the key. That's the, the whole New Age key is believing that you're God. When the world believes that and understands that, it's like energy can just run smoothly through all of humanity because all of humanity is God. It's obviously a lie. When I was a kid, you know, it, and that was a long time ago, uh, when I was a kid, you know, if, if you did something and, they didn't li and your friend didn't like it, they'd say, hey, who do you think you are anyway, God? And now, these days, it's like, if you don't say that you're God, you know, you're a fundamentalist Christian. I mean, it's getting there. Uh, thanks to some of the big names out there in, in TV land, uh, this attitude or this belief that we're divine, that we're God, is coming into play. I think Christians really have a hard time understanding how, like, how could, how could I say that I'm God? You know, I mean, it's like, it wasn't like I was saying I was the God, but that I'm part of God, that God is the, the complete 
uh, wholeness of all of humanity. I mean, it's like it's a, it's a composite thing. And I'll, I'll explain that. But when Jesus said in Matthew 24, 3 to 5, when the disciples asked, you know, what will be the, the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? He said, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Guess what we said? That we were Christ. It's an unbelievable scripture in the, in the authorized version that, you know, many will come in my name saying, I am Christ. That's exactly what we said. And that's the thing that's so amazing about the Bible. I, I don't know if there's anybody here that doesn't have faith in the Bible, but when I got to a certain stage that I'll, I'll develop in my talk, the Bible read, I want to say like the morning newspaper, but the morning newspaper is not very reliable, but it was like so current. It was just, it was like it was just jumping off of the pages and it was describing everything that I'd been involved in. If you read the Bible carefully, deception, warfare, you know, the battle is just throughout the Bible, but so is the victory. But it, it, there's, there's a battle going on right now, and I think a lot of people in the church just don't really understand how serious it is, and uh, I'll try to develop that a little bit tonight. The point is not to scare you with what's going on. The point is to let you know what is going on so that you can do something about it, which is to be knowledgeable enough to share with your lost friends and family and coworkers, and to be able to contend for the faith. The scripture that I kind of want to hold out there is 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Unfortunately, the church has become fairly ignorant of the devices, and the devices are going wild right now. So with that in mind, because I know the, the predominant attitude right now, there are pastors out there who have sort of a Norman Vincent Peale ministry where they're, they're real upbeat, and once in a while they'll throw in and say, you know, you know give, the, give the devil like a, a kick in a behind or something, and they kind of, that's, that's about as far as it goes. Um, I know that one of the things in the Purpose Driven Life that jumped out at me was when Rick Warren said, it's helpful to know that Satan is entirely predictable. And I went, that's real helpful. I mean, that's, you know, that's going to really help a lot of people. It's almost like uh, Robert Schuller's statement where he said, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you'll never have to worry about the devil. I mean, and Robert Schuller, I found, I, I just want to address a little bit because John mentioned the Purpose Driven Life. I just want to mention that... Um, the main problems that I had with that, and I developed them more in my book, number one, when Rick Warren introduced the idea of purpose, he mentioned Bernie Siegel. That was his reference point. And I'm reading along as an ex-New Ager, and I'm going, Bernie Siegel, what is he doing? <laughs> He's a New Age leader. Bernie Siegel has a spirit guide named George, and Bernie Siegel talks about how George helps him in all of his decisions. Bernie Siegel is on the board of advisors of the guy that introduced me to the Course in Miracles, Gerald Jampolsky's organization, the Attitudinal Healing Center in, in California. Bernie Siegel was the first celebrity endorsement for New Age leader Neil Donald Walsh's book, Conversations with God. Bernie Siegel endorsed Robert Schuller's 1995 book on prayer. It, it didn't make any sense. I just, I'm shaking my head going, this is bizarre. You know, well, maybe he just made a mistake. But then what I found out in my research was that Robert Schuller had a really strong influence and relationship with Bernie Siegel. And I went, well, that's interesting. And the further I went, the deeper I went, Robert Schuller kept coming up. It was like, I'm not reading as much Rick Warren here as I am Robert Schuller. So I ended up, you know, sadly having to read like about 15 of Robert Schuller's books. And I found so much of what Rick Warren was doing. You know, Rick Warren talks about a new reformation and Robert Schuller said his favorite book was his 1982 book, Self-Esteem, the New Reformation, in which he mentions Gerald Jampolsky. That's the man that Bernie Siegel's on the board of directors of the New Age organization. You know, I've got all these rabbit trails. You know, you go down here, and pretty soon it's like you end up, whoop, there's Robert Schuller again, and ooh, there's Rick Warren. But the biggest one that really hit me was on page 88 when Rick Warren, out of his 15 different Bibles that he used, picked... Out of 15 Bibles, he picked this to talk about Ephesians 4, 6. He said that God rules everything, is everywhere, and is in everything. And it was at that moment that I hung my head and I said, oh, Lord, you want me to write another book? You know, it's like, 
I had such a nice job. I really did. I was on the California coast as a hospice social worker. I love my job. We were able to witness to people right at the end of their life. And I did my case notes with waves crashing, and, and I had to go and read Robert Schuller. But, you know, I praise God because I learned a lot about, and this has happened with all the books that I've written, I've learned a lot about what's going on as I write the book. God just brings things to you. You need to understand that God in everything is the bottom line of the New Age movement. It's the bottom line of the deception that's coming at the world. And for Rick Warren to say that and to pick that, I just, you know, now his argument, he has an apologist who stepped forward and said, Rick Warren definitely didn't mean that. In 1997, Rick Warren said, God is not in everything. That's pantheism. Well, that sounds real good if you don't take it to the next level, which is, well, if he said that in 1997, why is he saying five years later that God's in everything? God's not the author of confusion. So that one statement just you know, made it so clear that this was a very confused pastor and that he was under the influence of Robert Schuller, much to his you know, denial. The other thing that he mentioned uh, that really was wild was in talking about when Jesus was being just before being taken up in Acts 1, he said that Jesus was telling his disciples essentially that prophecy is none of your business. And I went, what? That's how I got saved. When Jesus said, you know, about deception and the false Christ and all that, I mean, Matthew 24 was just jumping off the page, and and it's like I I got saved through that and some other circumstances. And he's saying that prophecy is none of our business. It just didn't make any sense. Interestingly, uh, emerging church leader Brian McLaren says exactly the same thing. Jesus basically said that prophecy is none of our business. Well, guess what? Alice Bailey, the matriarch of the New Age movement, said that prophecy is none of our concern. Pretty close to the same thing. And Alice Bailey, her book is The Reappearance of the Christ, Ushering in the False Christ. Overlapping language, denials, and then you read like David says, and I forget which psalm it is, but he talks of the person who has a double heart. And uh, James talks of double-mindedness, men who are unstable in all their ways with double minds. Uh, Paul in Timothy talks about having a double tongue. Uh, You know, Tonto, a long time ago with the Lone Ranger, used to call it a forked tongue. I mean, it's like you get, you get cornered. I remember there was a New Age leader years ago. I mean, I'm sorry, a little uh, Freudian slip. It was, a, it was a supposed evangelical leader who was aligned with New Agers. And uh, he, he was really backed into a corner with all of these New Age affiliations he had. And he got way in the corner, and it was like all of a sudden he goes, watch out for the New Age. It's really dangerous. And everybody goes, what are you talking about? Listen to him. You know, New Age. He professes Jesus. Don't buy it. Many say, Lord, Lord. And Jesus said, I don't even know who they are. You know, what they say, it's like, do you remember like Saturday Night Live years ago, the guy would say, hi, I really like you. You're a really nice guy. I hate you. I hate you. You know, it was like, it's kind of like this. And it was out of the bottom of their thing. And that's really what these guys are doing. They're, they're going, you know, we love the Lord. You know, we love the Lord. God's in everything, you know. And, and if they get away with it, they just keep going. It's like two steps forward, one step back. And that's where the church is at right now. It's being transitioned into great deception. Uh, How did I get into the New Age? It was a waitress, and I liked her. And I invited her over to my house. And in the course of the evening's conversation, she said that she loved the country music of John Prine, who I hadn't heard of at that time. And she had a friend of a friend who was coming in from out of town who was a psychic. So the next day... I went down to the music store and got two John Prine albums, which were actually pretty good, and signed up to see the psychic. So when it was time to see the psychic, I was a little bit nervous because I was from the East Coast. You know, you don't see psychics. It's a little bit kind of, you know, you just don't do that kind of thing. But, and this is the key, and this is what I hope I can make some points that are, I went ahead and did it because somebody that I kind of liked and trusted told me it was okay. How many of you have had somebody give you a book saying, you've got to read this book. You got, it's the secret. Read this book. It's really good. And then the next day, and you go, well, I don't know. Then the next day, somebody says, hey, i got a really good book for you to read the secret. And you go, hey, whoa, whoa, meant to be. 
You know, there's a reason for everything. No accident. You hear this all the time now. Whatever happened to spiritual temptation? You know, it's like your attitude should be, well, what's the book about? Or, or I'll read the book. But, you know, don't start jumping and thinking that this has got to be God because it's coming at me from two directions. And I'll show you how that worked in my life. And I really bought it. And I went way, way far out by doing that. So the psychic is, is doing the reading. And, and she said, I'm having trouble finding your aura. And I'm going, great. You know, it's like, it's all you want to hear in a psychic reading is you have no aura. Then she says, well, I'm starting to see it, but it's really black. And I'm going, okay, well, at least you're finding something. And th then, then she says, now I'm seeing a little bit more. You're very spiritually underdeveloped. You've, you've, you've been very mental in your life, and you've been very physical, like with sports and things like that. And she was right. Then she just started rattling off all the stuff about me that she had no business knowing. None at all. And she had my attention. I thought, well, you know, well, she's got a gift here, you know. Okay, this is kind of interesting. Then I felt like this tingling sensation over my head. It was really bizarre. And I'm just sitting there going, what is going on? And she said, are you aware there's a ball of light over your head right now? And I said, I don't know what that is, but I can feel there's something up there. She said, it's a ball of light. I said, well, what's a ball of light doing there? She said, you have a lot of help on the other side. And I said, what's the other side? She said, where you have loved ones that have passed on and people that, spirits that are, are interested in your well-being. They want to help you in your life, but you need to give them permission. So that night, I lay on the flat roof of my house in a canyon under a starry sky, feeling very spiritual, and I said, all you on the other side, I would like your help in my life. I want to be more spiritual. I want to grow. It's the opposite of the sinner's prayer. Was I sincere? Absolutely. Did I think I was getting involved with something bad? No. I thought I was doing something good. It says in, uh, I've learned this since Clorinda, because I asked, I asked John when I was talking about it, where, you know, it's in Ephesians, you don't give place to the devil. And I just opened a door. You know, when Jesus says in, in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Did you ever read 1 Timothy 4.1? I'm sure you did. This, this, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the, in the latter days. Uh, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That, that's kind of like, a, you know, you read that and you go, well, that's kind of interesting, you know. There it is. Seducing spirits, ball of light. Satan comes as an angel of light. And what it brought was false teachings. Doctrines of devils is, you know, false teachings, teachings that aren't from God. And so, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is always there, and you can always invite him in. But they're there knocking too, and they're wanting to get in. And they're using contemplative prayer these days to do it. And that's being taught in the emerging church as almost like a practice where you repeat Scripture, and then you wait to hear what God would tell you. But they give you, I, I mean, Ray will talk more about this, but I, I never hear them giving any warnings. They never say, but make sure you try the spirits. If something, and when you hear a voice or something, try the spirits, 1 John 4, 1. You don't hear that. So my friend Jesse, who is a Christian 10 or 15 years, fasted for three days went to a Christian retreat, went into the valley and prayed to God and said, God, I want to know what you want to have for me. What kind of ministry would you have for me? And he heard, you're going to be a healer. And that was exactly what he wanted to do. And then he heard it again, you're going to be a healer. And he said, yes, Lord, with you working through me. And he said when he heard it the third time, the hair stood up on his arm and he realized it wasn't God's voice he was listening to. He tested the spirits and he cast it out and cast it away from him, whatever the case may be, and it left. It was not the Lord. But you don't hear this. And the, and the reason I bring that case up is because I think it's really easy to say, well, yeah, Warren was in the New Age. You know, he was in the occult. You know, he was really deceived. And so, of course, the spirit world. This is a guy that was a Christian, a sincere Christian, for 10 or 15 years, fasted and prayed, and was at a Christian retreat. I know a New Age woman by the name of Marvin Marks Hubbard, who repeated scripture and then got one of the biggest, nastiest visions of the future you'd ever want to read. And you can if you want to. It's online, reinventingjesuschrist.com, chapter 2, Barbara Marks Hubbard. She talks about how the world is going to link up as one, one day. And then she also goes on to say that those who do not believe in their own divinity will be taken out. 
Sorry, it's just, this is in their writings. We're at that stage where the New Age folks are getting very bold in what they're doing. Oprah Winfrey is now on the XM satellite radio teaching A Course in Miracles. And I'm going to be talking about that at length in the next session, and I'll touch upon it tonight. But The Course in Miracles, I'll introduce it when I get there through my testimony because I'm sort of moving ahead. I, I, I want to keep it in context. But it's reputedly from Jesus, and it's, it's another Jesus. It's 2 Corinthians 11:4, when Paul chided the Corinthians and said, if another Jesus, you know, with another spirit, another gospel comes along, you might just go along with it. Well, guess what? That's what's happening today. And it's, I mean, I took an airplane yesterday down to Costa Mesa, and uh, they said, oh, would you like a headset to listen to XM Satellite Radio? And I realized I could literally listen to Marianne Williamson, Oprah's featured teacher, teaching A Course in Miracles as I flew down to Costa Mesa to talk about A Course in Miracles. I mean, it's, it's like we, we have conferences and things are getting on the Internet and information is getting out, but we don't have the kind of mic that Oprah has. And I just want to say something about Oprah. Romans 10. She has a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Those of us that were in the New Age, if we had the format that she had, we would have gladly gone on TV. We wanted the world to know that we had the truth. We really believed it. So anyway, after that psychic reading, things started to happen in my life. The next thing, that, and, and that's what happens. One thing kind of dovetails into another. There's this flow. Go with the flow. Well, I, I've actually got an article that was in the Fresno Bee. It was a front-page article, and uh, it's, it was actually the feature headline. It says, Going in the Wrong Direction. And then it says right under that, It just takes one misstep for even the most experienced hiker to go missing. And then the article starts, It's called the Cascade Effect, a catchy name for the way one mistake leads to another and a quick explanation for how a hiker who takes one step off an established trail is one step closer to trouble. Park rangers and search and rescue experts say that hundreds of hikers take that one wrong step each year. The key, they say, is where their next step takes them, back toward the trail or further down a perilous path. Sounds like a Christian writer almost. I mean, he's using I mean, it's a beautiful metaphor for what happens. I took one step off the trail. I mean, you could say that the, the, the path would be the Lord's, and I wasn't on that, but I was... Basically, I was uncommitted, you know, as far as I was going to spiritually. I took that one step off with the psychic, and then I just, it was a cascade effect. It kept going deeper and deeper. The same thing can happen to you. If you get a book like The Secret, which is really popular right now, and there's spin-off books and everything else, and if you start to think that, you know, it's a kind of get-rich book that, that's been endorsed by Oprah and others, and... Uh, if you don't know that on page 164, the author says, you are God in a physical body. There it is. Anybody brings you the secret, just say, you know what, I'm not God in a physical body. I don't want to read the book. Thank you very much. But actually, that's kind of a smart answer. What you would really say to them is what I said to a guy sitting on a plane when I was on my way to uh, Clorinda. Uh, I was trying to figure out how I would start the, the talk that night, and this guy sitting next to me reading spinoff books from The Secret, and I recognized the books that he was reading. And I said, are you familiar with the book The Secret? And he goes... Yeah. I said, uh, what do you think? He says, I, I really like it. I'm on my way to a conference, and you know, there's a lot of good principles in there. And I said, what do you think about on page 164 where it says, you're God in a physical body? He said, what? I said, yeah, it says, you're God in a physical body. Does that trouble you? He goes, yeah, I'm a new believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Stopped him in his tracks. We had a great conversation and the reason I bring it up is because I think the Lord is trying to arrange circumstances with all of us so that we can witness to people. And we can, you don't have to read the whole secret. All you have to know is a few little things about a book to be able to let people know why it's wrong. And there's enough of us that have been assigned this task of writing books. You know, Ray, who's going to be speaking tomorrow night, has written a wonderful book, Time of Departing. It talks all about contemplative prayer, which is at the heart of the emerging church. It's, I, think, I think God used Ray's book to warn all of us about how something as innocent sounding as contemplative prayer can be dangerous. Experience is the name of the game in the new age. I experienced the ball of light. 
I felt, well, hey, that's coming to me, and I took off and I went with it. Experience is talked about by New Age leaders. They say if it's between experience and, and, written, and a written word, then you go with the experience. I mean, and that's what the church is doing now too. And the emerging church is leading people into spiritual experience. And then the spiritual experience trumps, in their mind, the Word of God. The Word of God has to always prevail <clears throat> as, your, as your guide. This, this article up here, it has a compass and a map. And it doesn't really say anything in the article about, but I mean, you need to have something to find direction. And the Bible is it. And I, I don't know, I guess a friend of mine said that when my wife and I came across, we were given sort of a gift of faith. And the reason we, he said that is because we had seen so clearly how deceived we were. The Bible just read like, like yeah, yeah, oh my goodness. Like, it was just telling every, I mean, all the scriptures just clicked in. You know, where you might see, many will come in my name saying, you know, I am Christ. You know, you get that intellectually. We did it. You know, we were, we were the people Jesus was warning us about. You know, it's like it's pretty sobering when you realize that he's, he's warning you about you. You know. So the next, the next step in my journey was with uh, Guru Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. How did that happen? Another spiritual meant-to-be experience. And this is what's going to happen to your friends. They're, they're already, some of them are already coming under this. I really believe holy laughter was a dress rehearsal for, I mean, I've, I've heard people say, oh, holy laughter, yeah, that fad came through the church. You know what the Course in Miracles says? The world is going to end in laughter. Think about that. That holy laughter movement, a lot of people that didn't do it don't know that much about it, but it was outrageous. I mean, people were really convinced that it was from God. And, I, and if there's anybody here that, you know, maybe is squirming and doesn't agree with that, I have an article online uh, I'm trying to remember what it was called. I think it was called uh, Holy Laughter or Strong Delusion. And I document, if you go to the Bible, John will tell you, there's not much reference in there about laughter being like that, that God's going to just rip through you with laughter. And especially these days, you think God's laughing about what's going on? I don't think so. I think it was a dress rehearsal for what's coming down at the end. And when you read this whole planetary Pentecost, this way that humanity is going to light up when everybody gets it that they're God, you know, they're, 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 we're heading into incredible times. We're, we're heading into persecution. We're heading into, I mean, Jesus said, blessed are those who are not offended in me. I mean, do you hear some of the things that are being said about Christians these days? I mean, fundamentalists is just, everybody's just fundamentalist, fundamentalist. You know, do you believe in an angry, wrathful God? Um, you're, you think your way is the only way? I mean, this stuff's starting to come fast and heavy. Neil Donald Walsh, who Oprah Winfrey calls one of the 10 most memorable thinkers that she's ever met, has said that God has told him, and he's got this documented in his book, The New Revelations, A Conversation with God. God tells Neil Donald Walsh, let me make something clear. You may have to give up some of your most religious beliefs. Then he says, the era of the single Savior is over. I said that yesterday when I was doing a radio interview with Chuck Smith, and Chuck just kind of went, ugh. I mean, it's like, you guys aren't reading this stuff, but a lot of people in the world are. Conversations with God was on number one on the New York Times bestseller list for quite a long time. This isn't some little obscure book in a back shelf in the airport somewhere. These were bestsellers, and people were devouring these books. Neil Donald Walsh was actually flown to Chicago. This is his own account flown to Chicago to do an interview with Oprah with that book, Conversation with God. In that book, he says, you're a God, uh, you just don't know it. I mean, and, and he's not just saying it, his God is saying it. He's speaking for God. In the old days, they used to call that false prophet. I mean, and, and people would get on TV, you know, somebody like Billy Graham would get on TV and say, that is a false prophet. And then people would go, oh, okay, you know, we know Neil Donald Walsh. Some of you may never even heard his name before tonight. But he's been featured all over the place. And there he was, you know, being interviewed by Oprah. And he said that it was this fantastic interview, two-hour special interview. She flew him into Chicago. But then it didn't play. They didn't put it on TV for like a year. It hadn't been on. And some of his people got anxious and emailed. And her people emailed back and said, look, cool it. Don't get your people, you know, up in arms. You're just too far ahead of the curve. 
people aren't ready for it yet. That was about, I think, maybe like four, five, six years ago. What's she doing now? Teaching A Course in Miracles on XM Satellite Radio. Apparently, people are more ready for it. A Course in Miracles, reputedly from Jesus, the heart of my New Age teachings, said, the Jesus of the Course said, the journey to the cross should be the last useless journey. Do not make the pathetic error of clinging to the old rugged cross. How about this one? A slain Christ has no meaning. It's kind of like the opposite of Ephesians 2, where enmity was slain on the cross. The cross is the whole, that's where everything happened. That, that's the victory that we cling to, the victory over sin, over Satan, over evil. That's, that, that is what makes us, when we, when we ask Jesus and, and recognize that atonement on the cross, that's what makes us born again. Jesus said, marvel not that I said ye must be born again. Those who are born in the flesh are flesh. Those who are born in the spirit are spirit. The New Age wants to take the flesh and say that we're all one in spirit. When you hear we are all one, it sounds kind of appealing. You know, it's like who's against oneness? It's kind of like mom and apple pie, you know, oneness and peace, you know, love and peace. They did a lot of love and peace in the Haight-Ashbury. You know, what happened to the Haight-Ashbury? They ended up burned out, stoned, and devastated. Love and peace. That's, and that, this is just a new love and peace movement, but it's dead serious. So Rajneesh, how did I meet him? I was, it was New Year's Eve, Big Sur. I don't know if you know the California coast. It's probably one of the most beautiful places in California on the California coast. Big Sur, New Year's Eve. I was with my girlfriend at the time. Wanted to do something kind of like significant. You know how on New Year's Eve, you, know, you want to kind of do something spiritual or significant. I bought a book at this big, beautiful bookstore called Nepenthe. And it was by an Indian master called Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. He had not been known at that time. This is the guru that ended up in Oregon, for those of you that remember that guy. I didn't go to Oregon. I just almost went to India. But I have this book by Rajneesh. And, and I, I just, I'm sort of captivated by it. It's called Journey Towards the Heart. And I started reading some of the stories in there, and they were like really good. I mean, they were story- some of the stories in there Jesus could have told, and they were true. But then he also had other things in there like you're divine and whatever, but I didn't know. It sounded good, made me feel good. So I got the book. I ended up about a half an hour later on top of a mountain that was about a mile away. We, we had been told to go look at these little cabins that this guy had called Deachins, and the man showed us the cabins, and then he looked in my eyes and he said, how would you like to stay on top of this mountain tonight? I went, wow, you know, New Year's Eve, well, this is kind of cool. Yeah, sure. So at sunset, we're going up this mountain road with a driver named Orion, and, and we arrive at the top of the mountain, and we're above the clouds. When you look down, there's like a cloud bank. We go up to this room that's on the top of the house, and it's like being in a cabin in the sky. I don't know if you can envision that, but it's just nothing but clouds. I mean, it's like when you're in an airplane almost, looking down on this cloud bank. And it was like profoundly wonderful. I put the suitcase down, and on the bed stand, on the nightstand next to the bed, was a book called Only One Sky by Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. It was like, whoa, whoa. And it's like meant to be. <laughs> meant to be by whom? I didn't have that in my framework. I didn't know there was deception. I didn't know there was a devil. I didn't know that things could feel good and be bad. So I was off and running with Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. That's how I learned how to meditate. That's where I had a meditation where I experienced oneness. You're given feel-good spiritual experiences that make you think that what you're doing is right. It's, it's, you're being led down the path back to the article. It's part of that cascade effect. You're going further and further away from the path but you think you're getting closer and closer to the truth. And it's just the scripture that comes to mind is ever learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Scripture has a, a reply for everything that these guys do. So Rajneesh, meant to be experienced, learning my, about my divinity. The next step was going to a psychic in my hometown. And she would do her readings the night before if you can believe that. She'd have it all written up, and she would have done the reading at home, and she was right almost all the time about what she was seeing. And it wasn't like, oh, you're going to have a good week. I mean, it was like pinpointing really specific things. 
Those of you who are familiar with Acts 16.16, 16, Paul and Silas were in Philippi, and there was a, you know, a soothsayer, psychic, following them around. She was actually saying, these are men from the Most High God. It wasn't like she was, you know, she was saying things that were true, but she was really hounding them. And Paul turned and said, you know, divining spirit in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, leave, and the spirits left. And that whole story is the story of a psychic who lost her ability because the ability came from divining spirits. It wasn't like she was born with this gift and used the gift for, you know, the devil or used the gift for God. And I've heard that one a lot. It's divining spirits. My wife was extremely psychic in the New Age. It was unbelievable how psychic she was. She used to be able to... I'd have to hide presents in a neighbor's house because she would pick it off. You know, I, I, I got her a stained glass one time and I put it in the neighbor's house and early one morning she says, it's really beautiful. I said, what? She said, the stained glass? And I said, yeah, and what does it look like? And she goes, well, I think it's a flower. I said, and what color is the flower? And she goes, purple? I go, yeah, you're a lot of fun. <laughs> she had that ability when we came to the Lord, and the way that we came to the Lord was a book, and in the book, a very knowledgeable woman said, when you come to the Lord, surrender all of your gifts to the Lord. I don't want them, Lord, unless they're from you. Take them away. Guess what? My wife lost her psychic ability. So I can get her presence now. <laughs> so here we go down this road of all these things just feeling really good. And everything kind of dovetailing and uh, going further and further into deception. The next step was at the Sacramento Holistic Health Institute. I was going to, well, I was at a, at a hot spring. Everybody was talking about the Sacramento Holistic Health Institute. Like somebody here would talk about it, somebody that I'm going, you know, and you, you hear this one too. Somebody's trying to tell me something. Well, who's the somebody? <laughs> you know, don't let people say there's a reason for everything. It's meant to be. You say, well, meant to be by whom? You know, I mean, what, what are we talking about here? You know, let's get specific. So anyway, the Sacramento Holistic Health Institute became the next part of my journey where I was learning therapeutic massage. Well, the people that were teaching massage, they're into the new age, so they're reinforcing everything that I'm learning. And you're going to find that if you go to a... Most therapists today are pretty well filled with new age stuff. Uh, if you go to get a massage, most likely most people doing the massage are into a lot of New Age principles. I'm sure there's some Christian people that are doing massage, but generally, I think in uh, Clorinda, I think even Clorinda, Iowa, the guy was doing you know massage and he was leading people. And you know, and that, here you are getting your massage, and it you know it feels good. And, and it's, meanwhile, you know, hey, you know, I know you're not feeling too good about yourself, but did you realize you're divine? You know, just awaken to your own consciousness. You know, and it's like, oh yeah, well that's that's a whole lot better than thinking I'm a sinner or whatever. But it's not, you know, if you're a sinner, God changes your, your nature and you're not predisposed to sin anymore. I mean, people just think, you know, like Christians are just like these nasty people that go around pointing fingers and saying, and it's a stereotype that they're really building in the world today. You know, these, you know, fundamentalist people who are just, everybody's going to hell. And, and this is the one that's really hitting the heart now, which is, if these guys have their way, the world's going to get blown up. You know, well, I don't know too many Christians that are really looking for the apocalypse to, you know, for Armageddon to happen. And I mean, they're making it look like, you know, that every Christian wants to blow up an abortion clinic. You know, you've got a few that do stuff like that, and they're probably run by the devil just to do it. So anyway, the, this whole idea of health and and, and well-being was kind of co-opted by the New Age. And so when you get involved with, you know, you know doing um, something like uh, massage, you know, you end up getting all this with it, you know, or, or the counseling brings it, brings it all in. Well, when in the class, one of the people in the class, one of the gals in the class said, Warren, you've got to read this book by Gerald Jampolsky called Love is Letting Go of Fear. It's really good. I read it. I really liked it. Why? Because he talked about forgiveness, and that wasn't something I really knew that much about. Forgiveness was sort of an abstract concept that, you know, I mean, yeah, it's good to forgive, but, you know, I wasn't very good at it. This guy really, he had some ways of kind of looking at things that seemed good, sounded good, and he said, everything that I'm telling you in this book, it was a little simple book with cartoons, and it was like just, and he said, if you like this, everything I learned came from A Course in Miracles. So what did I do? I ran out, you know, meant to be. Ran out and got the Course in Miracles. 
I was reluctant because there was Christian terminology in the book. And that kind of put me off. So with the book in hand, I went to the counter of the bookstore and I said, you know anything about this book, Course in Miracles? The guy looks at me and he goes, oh yeah. He says, I've been doing the Course in Miracles for 16 months and it changed my life. I said, okay, I'll get it. I mean, these are the things that happen. It's like, it's like the devil, I don't know how he does it. It's pretty ingenious, but he's a pretty ingenious guy. He, just, he opens a door, you walk down it, and there's just the right thing happening just at that moment to, make, to confirm whatever you're doing. So I started studying A Course in Miracles. I'm going to go into it more next time, but it was reputedly from Jesus, uh, a psychologist in New York City heard an inner voice that said, this is A Course in Miracles, please take notes. And for uh, seven years she took notes, and A Course in Miracles was the final product. Gerald Jampolsky, the book that I read, was one of the books that got it moving. 1992, when my book, The Light That Was Dark, warning about The Course in Miracles, was being edited in Chicago, Oprah Winfrey in Chicago was hosting The Oprah Winfrey Show and had on her show Marianne Williamson, an unknown author, who had a book called A Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of Course in Miracles. The book catapulted to number one on the New York Times bestseller list in three weeks. It was one of Oprah's first book club features. A slain Christ has no meaning. That's what they're teaching. That's the bottom line. There's no sin. There's no devil. Atonement in the course of miracles, according to that Jesus, is at one meant. You are saved when you recognize your own oneness. Your oneness comes from this. Only love is real. God is love. Therefore, God is everything. I don't know if you saw that, but it's like it's real slick. That's what they do. It's like, you know, only love is real. God is love. God is in everything. God is everything. The very first story in the Chicken Soup for the Soul book, which, by the way, is written by New Age leader Jack Canfield. When I was in the New Age, we, were, had, a, we had a leadership meeting, if you want to call it that, and somebody came in and said, Hey, we got somebody in education, Jack Canfield. He had been writing for New Age magazine. He was teaching kids how to get spirit guides. The guy's a New Age leader. He's written Chicken Soup for the Soul. The very first story in that book is love, the creative force. It's a real simple little story on love. You can't find any fault. There's nothing New Age in it. But love, the creative force. You create with love because love is God and you are God. And when all humanity acts together, creating in love, they create a new future an alternative to Armageddon, rerouting out of the Bible and taking us away from danger. Therefore, only Christians are inhibiting that. And that's throughout the writings of these New Age writers. Documented at reinventingjesuschrist.com. Two years I spent writing that book and putting it so online. It's been there for five years. Jack Canfield, in that same book, Chicken Soup for the Soul, has a story called The Golden Buddha. In that story, he says there's a golden Christ within all of us. Chicken soup for the soul. It's being sold in Christian bookstores all over the place. And the, the analogy I like to make is a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And a little chicken bone in the chicken soup can kill you. It's like, it's just, you know, that happens. People actually do it. And that, it's waiting there. And I tell you this because th these are just some examples. The secret, you know, it's being pumped all over the place. Ken Blanchard, who was brought forward by Rick Warren when, he was, when Rick Warren was introducing his peace plan. Meanwhile, Neil Donald Walsh, the New Age, has their peace plan. Ken Blanchard was brought forward. Ken Blanchard has been sympathetic to New Age stuff for years. He was actually called to the carpet uh, by a number of researchers. And uh, it was shown clearly that he was endorsing like Deepak Chopra's books. He was, just, he was involved in all sorts of stuff. And he goes, oh, I, you know, I made a mistake. I didn't know. And everybody goes, leave him alone, forgive him. He made a mistake. And then he just goes right on as head of the Lead Like Jesus movement. They're doing workshops around the country. Guess who was in San Diego last weekend with some of the secret teachers speaking? Ken Blanchard. But meanwhile, he's got a discernment ministry called Watchman Fellowship that supposedly has been keeping him, you know, kind of accountable, which put everybody off. It's like the old, you know, like, hey, he's saying, you know, he's saying all the right things. Leave him alone. Well, we're not picking on him, but if a guy's head of the lead like Jesus movement, let's not be mixing our teachings with the new age. So these are just a few examples, you know, 
for us not to be ignorant of our enemy's schemes. It's like, you know, I don't think you need to go and, you know, tell your neighbor that they need to, you know, burn the chicken soup for the soul book, but I think it's a place where you can start talking. You can say, you like that chicken soup for the soul book? Did you read that story about the golden Buddha by, you know, Jack Canfield? Uh, no, where was that? Well, yeah, it's here. Let me show you. He says there's a golden Christ in everyone. You know, what do you think about that? Golden Christ in everyone? They're not there yet, people. They're trying to get there really quick. That's why I think Oprah's teaching the Course in Miracles. This is a key year. They're coming right at the church. They're coming right at everybody. And we, we've got, if we're going to do Bible studies, if we're going to read the Bible and do all the stuff we do, we've got to use it practically, too. We can't just have like it be a, a place to get together and just make ourselves feel good by reading the Bible. We've got to get out there and we've got, to, we've got to witness. You know how many people came up to me when I was in the New Age? I was running around the office in orange clothing. I was meditating with my developmentally disabled clients, teaching them affirmations. You know how many people came up to me and said, you know, Warren, you know, hey, what you're doing is really dangerous. I had Christians in the office. One gal came up to me with a Bible, and she said, I want to give you a Bible. I go, okay, thank you. you know, and I, I'm not blaming her, but I'm just, I would remember if somebody came up to me. I don't know that I would have you know, done anything about it, but probably wouldn't have, but unless it was the Holy Spirit. So I get really involved with the Course of Miracles. I get involved with a channeler who's channeling a thing called the source. Well, the source is the thing that is at the heart of the secret. There's an there's a enti- out-of-body entity named Abraham who inspired the woman who wrote the source. So Oprah on her XM satellite radio program is interviewing Abraham. Not the woman who's channeling Abraham. She's, she's interviewing Abraham, the spirit that's coming through this woman. What does Oprah say? She says, you know, my, my television audience isn't ready for this yet. I'm sorry, as nice as Oprah is, and as, as zealous as she is to do what she's doing, she's manipulating. She's manipulating. She knows what she's doing. and she's, it, I mean, we did the same thing. It was kind of like, yeah, if you Christians could just go a little bit further and get it that you're God, you know, God bless you. You know, I mean, it was, it was a condescending attitude. You know, we didn't look at it that way. We just thought what we had was right, and that was the way it was. So I'm pretty much, you know, we're going full bore we're, we're in our Course in Miracles group. Uh, we're st- I did it for two years at night. It was just like you do Bible studies here. We did Course in Miracles studies. That's what they're doing on, you know, they're doing a lesson a day. Marianne Williamson, this isn't a little thing. It's an hour a day on XM Satellite Radio daily teaching the course. So we're doing all this, everything. We're flying high. We're feeling good. You know, we're, we're, we're a part of this powerful, new, cutting-edge movement that's going to help change the world. And that's the same movement that's right there today. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it seems, with, with Joy, the, the, the woman who's now my wife and who had become my friend and then girlfriend during the last year or two of our involvement in the New Age, she was doing therapeutic massage. And one day, I was actually in San Francisco researching for a book I was going to write. Uh, at that time, it was you know, a book about my work at the Greyhound bus station as a social worker at night with Traveler's Aid and the people I met. And I was in San Francisco doing research. And... Uh, when I got home, she told me this incredible thing had happened where she was literally taken out of her body spiritually and was spiritually attacked. And, but she didn't say it in those terms because there is no evil, there is no darkness. Everything that happens to you, you create through your own thoughts. So you have to understand in the New Age, we would go inside ourself. What's wrong with me? What am I fearful of? We'd have to do our affirmations. We'd have to do whatever we had to do to get right as people because there is no evil. That's just, that's just an illusion. Well, we tried everything that we knew in the New Age to deal with this presence when it reasserted itself, and nothing worked. Um, We repeated our Course in Miracles affirmations. Uh, In my defenselessness, my safety lies. That's one of the Course in Miracles lessons. It's kind of like the opposite of put on the full armor of God. Uh, My sinlessness protects me from all harm. How do you like that one? You know, you can affirm these things all day long, but if they're not true... They might make you feel good, but they're not going to get you anywhere. And they didn't do anything with this presence. So we're beside ourselves. We've tried everything. This thing kind of comes, comes and goes. It's particularly affecting. I'm not feeling it, but I'm noticing it. It's affecting, you know, joy. So we go up to our Course in Miracles leader's house, and we say, look, this is what's going on. We've tried everything. You guys are the experts. What do you suggest? So the man who's been through like all sorts of metaphysical journeys and Edgar Cayce workshops, he says, well, let's, let's get in a circle and let's send love and light to this 
presence, whatever it is. So we close our eyes, you know, like, okay, you know, love and light, send love and light. And then we, we you come out of it, we break hands, and he says, okay, well, we'll see you. And I'm walking, starting to walk out the door, and I'm going, I turn around and say, is there anything else we can do? And his wife says, put on the full armor of God and stand fast against the wiles of the devil. And I'm like, what? <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? There's no devil. And her husband's beside himself. He's going, now, honey, you know. <laughs> Guess what? She used to be an evangelical Christian who was pulled out of the pews and went into the New Age. But somehow, from some place deep within her, that came out. So she said to us, she said, read Ephesians 6. I mean, she knew it. So we went home and read Ephesians 6, and here's, here was our response. You know, Trudy's really a nice person. She must have been involved with a church or something at one time. You know, she, isn't that sweet that she, you know, kind of brought that up? And we just dismissed it. Meanwhile, the presence didn't leave. We went down to Southern California at Christmas time in 1983. And uh, the presence we thought would not travel with us or, or be able to travel down there, it did. My, mo- my mother-in-law, my future mother-in-law, is looking at her daughter, and she's looking at this new boyfriend and going, what's going on here with my daughter? I mean... Her face would kind of, Joy's face would kind of like, I used to call it kind of getting tweaked. You know, it's just, you could, is it there again? Yeah. I mean, it was, and it just, she'd get kind of like drowsy. So she was visiting a friend one day, and I went to a bookstore called the Either Or Bookstore, kind of symbolic in a way, in Hermosa Beach, California. And I was in the New Age healing section, and there was a book called The Beautiful Side of Evil by Johanna Michelson. And I just thought, well, that, that kind of might be interesting. And I pulled it out. I started reading, and this woman had a story that paralleled particularly Joy's, because Joy had all this psychic ability and had been traveling through all sorts of metaphysical New Age stuff. And I was so fascinated, I sat down on the floor and started taking notes. Well, lo and behold, this homeless, mentally ill guy that I had seen on the streets the day before came into the store, came all the way down to where I was sitting on the floor, and he started yelling at me, are you going to buy that book? What are you doing with that book? And I went, this is unbelievable. Does evil know that I'm reading about it? Can evil be orchestrated to come off the street and bother me? It was like a beginning understanding that there was something going on here. And so I'd worked with homeless, and I, you know, I kindly kind of got him out of the way, and I went back and I kept taking notes. Well, she had the most remarkable, and she had scripture in there, which I'd never really read. And the scripture went in on some level, and then she had the most remarkable solution for dealing with evil. Evil. I wrote it down. You got to understand how proud you are when you're in the new age. You'd think I'd buy the book. You don't want to buy a Christian book, but she had some good information, so I'd written it all down. So I left the book at the bookstore and went, went back. The next day, Joy had this presence again, and I said, let's go in your mom's backyard. I want to try something different. So I said, don't be afraid. And I said these exact words that I'd written down. I said, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command you to be gone. I forbid your presence here. I claim the blood of Jesus Christ upon us. Go to where Jesus would take you. And it was like, whoosh, it was gone. And Joy said, what was that? Wait, it's gone. What happened? I said, you know, I'm not entirely clear, but it has something to do with a victory that Jesus won on the cross of Calvary over evil and over Satan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we didn't have all the details, and I've actually had people say, well, wait a second, you know, excuse me, but you weren't a believer. How could you do that? And you know what my response is? You know, Philip came alongside the Ethiopian eunuch who was reading the Bible, trying to understand it. I was reading Johanna's book, trying to understand it, and she brought things to my attention just the way that Philip did, and I believed it, you know. I didn't fully understand it, but I believed it. And, you know, whatever the case, God honored it. And it took us a few months and some more harrowing experiences before we completely surrendered our life to the Lord. But, you know, all that stuff about, you know, the old hymns, Victory in Jesus. I was, I was speaking in Milwaukee a couple of weeks ago and opening up just before I came on, we sang the old rugged cross. And, and there's that line, so despised by the world. And I thought to myself, yeah, and how about Oprah? So loved by the world. And what about, what about Daniel when he said about Antichrist, he shall destroy wonderfully. 
Well, he's doing that wonderfully right through a really likable person named Oprah Winfrey who's allowing A Course in Miracles to be taught from another Jesus that says the journey to the cross should be the last useless journey, so despised by the world. I mean, you start to go, wow, this Bible's really true. You know, I mean, this stuff really works. You know, it's like we just went through this thing. We just devoured it and and could hardly believe all these references to, to what happened on the cross at Calvary. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And, you know, I've used the example. I used it last night. That comes at a lot of us. Like, are you saying that Jesus is the only way? Well, I came up with this example. You know, I I hope it was the Lord, but up on the top of the Trade Center, let's say, 72nd floor, there's there's an 85-year-old woman who's trapped in the corner with smoke enveloping the room. She's going down for the count. She's lying on the floor, and the door gets kicked in, and there's a fireman, and he says, lady, come with me. And she looks at him, and she says, are you the only one the chief sent? Does that ever happen? Or when you're off that trail, when you step off that trail and you get lost in the woods and a ranger finds you, do you say, are you the only ranger that came for me? You know, it doesn't make any sense. I I was on a show years ago and I said, I'm glad God sent someone, you know, and I was glad to just go with him. And, you know, don't be ashamed of your faith. You know, it, it says, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, blessed are those who are not offended at me. Stand up for your faith, contend for your faith, keep in the love of God, don't be ignorant of our enemy's schemes. But his victory is so alive today, it's almost unbelievable. I found out that evil and the devil was so much more than I'd ever imagined, but I found out that God is like exponentially so beyond that, it's, it's almost inconceivable. So he truly is our Lord and Savior. If there's anybody here tonight, you know, that, that doesn't, you know, is maybe searching and has kind of come to a point where they're kind of like maybe King Agrippa and they're kind of, you know, almost there. Do what my wife did. I didn't do this. I can't claim this. When we were in the New Age, her prayer was for truth. Pray for the truth. It's a, it's a fair prayer if you really want truth. It says in the Bible that tremendous deception came, delusion came because people did not have a love of the truth. That's where it's at. A woman wrote, Just the other day, she said, I've been in the New Age for 20 years. I read Johanna Michelson's book, and I realized that I was deceived about a lot of my New Age teachings, and I wanted to do something Christian. So I went online to find A Course in Miracles, and I came up with an article that you'd written, and I bought your book, The Light That Was Dark, and she said, I get it. I mean, it's, it's a miracle that things are happening at that level today, and that, that people are, are getting saved, people are getting the truth. And when I was talking to her, she said, Jesus actually came to me in a dream and showed me the darkness that was behind the new age. She said, how could that be? And I said, well, let me ask you something. Were you really wanting truth? And she said, yes, with all my heart. I said, well, guess what? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You were praying to the Lord. You didn't even probably know it. And I really believe that. If you want truth, I think truth, and I think Jesus will come to you. But it's a whole lot easier to ask directly. And whatever you do, don't ask for help on the other side. Could we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you for, for Pastor John Higgins and his, his body here. I, I thank you for his unwillingness to go with the flow and to, to go with your holy word. And I thank you for the support that he's offering those of us who are trying to expose some of the dangers that are out there. I I just pray that you would bless his body, bless everybody that's in this room, and I just pray that the rest of this conference would help people to open their eyes, not so much even to the deception and the darkness, but to the true love and the true light that is out there. Not the new age love that's not a true love. It's a deceptive love, a deceptive peace. And Lord, we're right on the cusp of, of coming to a place where world peace is going to become the issue. World peace is going to be the the primary thing that comes at the church, and we're we're going to be asked to compromise our faith for the purpose of world peace. Lord, help us to stand and to witness and to do everything we can to bring the truth to light. And may we be made strong, and may we stand in the face of the persecution that is not only coming, but it is already here. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done in our life. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.
Great. Well, praise the Lord. Um, I advise you that I get his book, uh, Deceived on Purpose, and take a good look at the um, Purpose Driven and all the things that are out there. And look at the, how he outlines the message and the Bible, the, the false versions of the Bible. And he has so much to say. Get that book, read it, and, and then determine if it's true or not. Um, I, I'm just blessed to, to have a brother like Warren stand up. Tomorrow, Ray, I, I read his book and uh, after Warren's. <laughs> his book just went, <laughs> whoa. And uh, there's a whole bunch of people who used to sit right over here. And I said something from Ray's book one day. And they came up and just I'm going to take his fire away. But they came up and they said, how dare you say that? I said, well, it's true. And they said, well, we're all from the same neighborhood up in Scottsdale. We're not coming back here anymore. I said, well, I'm sorry. I said, but you know who's going to lose out on this? They said, you. I said, no, you. You're gonna be, not going to be around truth anymore. You're going with a lie, and you're going to live in that lie. It's your decision you're making today. Go to a Bible-believing church. You don't like me. Find the Bible-believing church. But don't uh, go where you're going and why you're leaving. It really is. People are offended because of a lie. And they won't go and look at the truth. And that's what he's saying, that strong delusion is coming. And don't forget, we're in the last days, if you're a believer. We're in the Laodicean age. There is a great falling away. There's an apostasy going on. And we shouldn't be as shocked at these things. But good news is, we know what to do about it. We're going we're gonna to give you, on Sunday night, we have two young men. They're going to give you stories on missions into Mexico and to Colombia, South America, some slides. Um, we're going to show you things that can be done. We're trying to build a, uh, a little town in Mexico that can be given a pond. We can grow fish in the pond. They're so poor. Well, everybody's saying, you know, close the borders. Why don't we go over there and bring the way of life that they can live a life the church could grow food they got 50 acres how about getting them a tractor teaching them that grow the farm feed the natives people will come for the food so i brought the pastor here and asked him to sit down about this he's spanish and he speaks spoken he he spoke a little bit broken well he doesn't speak much english and i don't i don't speak much english either see so <laughs> so uh, i speak broken english <laughs> So uh, we got together, and he just couldn't understand. I said, what do you think it means here in 1 Peter 5? He says, feed the flock of God. Do you think that that means, if, you know, I lived in the street ministry. Feeding the flock of God was making meals every day for the people, and they listened after their belly was full. But then we would feed them after we gave them the message. And if they didn't stay for the, the one food, they couldn't get the other food. And, you know, It works. You just got to go out and feed the flock of God. And once people know that you're out there, you're doing work, and you're feeding, it's going to really... So you're going to see that Sunday night. Tomorrow night, Bill Koenig kicks it off tomorrow night. Bill Koenig just got back from his trip to Israel with President Bush. He was selected as part of the pool of reporters. Can you believe this? He's one-man reporter system. You know, the NBC, NBC, all these guys, they push one. It's him. So he goes, to, he goes to Israel and the Middle East with Bush, and he has so much to unload on us about the Middle East, Israel, and the last days and the things that are going on over there. And then we're going to hear Ray, and he's going to tell us more about the New Age, you see. And then Saturday morning, we're going to hear from Doug Warwick, and he's going to tell us what to do in the time of persecution, because this is all leading to that. Al Gore's book, um, what is it, um, Earth in Balance, out of, written by somebody out of balance, I think, but... Um, that he wrote a book and said that Christians stand in the way, Bible-believing Christians stand in the way of global solutions. Uh, that's something new. No, Ehrlich wrote Population Bomb back in the 60s. Bible-believing Christians have to be disposed of. Princeton University wrote a book, the head of Princeton University in the 60s. Bible-believing Christians got to be gotten rid of. They stand in the way of progress on the earth, earth warming. And earth. It's all written down. It's moving closer and closer. Get rid of the Christians, get rid of the Bible. And we'll be free to run the world the way they want. The Bible says in chapter 11 of the book of Revelation that Jesus is coming back to destroy them that destroyed the earth. So there is a destruction going on of the earth. But uh, it's not because of us. They think it is. So we'll see what happens in all these elections and stuff. Isn't this something, man? 
I mean, it's like when you see these people get on stage to debate, it's like looking at a Star Wars bar scene, you know? <laughs> You're waiting for somebody to draw a saber and cut somebody's arm off or something. Purple people with things sticking up, you know? These are our leaders, our future. <laughs> those drugs really, the, the drugs really affected America. <laughs> so bring friends tomorrow, tomorrow night, Friday night, probably more come. Bring friends that hear these men. Father, we pray as we go. Lord, bless us. Keep us from temptation. Deliver us from evil. That should mean more right now than it meant when we came here. But yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Lord, we know, Lord, that you made Jesus. You gave him all power in heaven and earth. You said that in Matthew 28, 18. And we know that he's going to be the Lord of the kingdom and Lord of all. And we submit to Jesus Christ. He's the head of this church. He's the head of our lives. He's the head of our homes. He's Lord of all. Go with us now, Jesus. Guide us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Uh, there'll be a table still in the back. Hang around. Do that. Uh, Warren will be back there to answer your questions, and you can pick up his book if you like. The Lord bless you. Jim is right here. You can get Jim on question him. And God bless. We start tomorrow at 6 o'clock. One.